this is the last talk of the day before we actually all get to leave and just go be irresponsible for the rest of the day. This is James. He's going to tell us about TypeScript and the decorators. I hear that's when you get like bows and ties and you put on the door and stuff, right? No, oh, okay. Yep, definitely. Oh, hello, hello. Check. Hey, hey there, there I am. Here he goes. All right. Thanks, Adrian. Nice to be here. My name is James, as Adrian said, and I'm going to be, as the slide says, de demystifying, well, I don't know. That might be a bit of a stretch, but I am going to be talking about TypeScript decorators. So welcome to the overview portion of the program. So decorators. What are decorators? Well, decorators allow us to do declarative programming in JavaScript. So what do we mean by declarative programming? Declarative programming is when you say what you want, as opposed with imperative programming, you say how to get what you want, right? And if we look at a real life example, this is going to be an Angular 2 component. The first version that we see is the imperative version. So we have our app component, which is a property that's being defined on this app object. We're making a call to ng core component, and we're passing in this configuration object literal. It has a selector property. My app is the element that this component is going to be associated with. And then the template is what it sounds like. It's the visual part of this component. Class is a method that's called on the end of component. And this defines the business logic, the class to associate with the component. If you can compare this to the declarative version, it looks a little different. Maybe not dramatically, but, but it does have a different feel to it. So we have at the top there, this is using uh, system.js modules. So at the top, we have an import to bring in something called component from Angular Core. And then we have our class down here called app component, which is just a regular ES6 class. And then, this is where we get into the decorator part, we have an at symbol followed by component. And you'll notice that we're passing in the same object literal that defines you know, the properties of that component. So again, the imperative version and the declarative version. You know, you, it, you may have different opinions about how different they look from each other, but my preference would be this one. I think it's cleaner. I think it expresses its intent a little bit more clear than the imperative version. So because this is a talk about decorators, of course, this is the direction that we're going to go in, right? We're going to take a look at how this plays out. So let's talk a little bit about browser support. So which browsers support decorators? Any guesses? Zero, right? Um, there's no native support for decorators at this time. What this means, of course, is that you need to transpile to ES5 or ES6. Now, luckily, once you transpile the decorator code, these are really the only two object methods that you need to make this work. So object define property and object get own property descriptor. Um, and as it turns out, there's been broad support for these two object methods for a long time, going all the way back to Chrome 5. Remember those days, the good old days? Firefox 4, and even IE9, if you can believe that, right? So pretty much, once you transpile this code, the resulting code from decorators is going to work just about anywhere. So let's talk a little bit about transpilers. TypeScript is what I'm going to be using today. But if TypeScript's not your thing, you can use Babel. So what is TypeScript? Just to kind of cover this real quickly if you haven't been paying attention to the space. So TypeScript can be summed up into three things. Not a high level. So to start with, it's a superset of JavaScript. So what this means is that any valid JavaScript is valid TypeScript. In fact, um, generally the way that you convert projects, or you used to do it, is you would just take your JavaScript files, change the extension from .js to .ts, and voila, you had TypeScript files. Um, it's even gotten better these days. You can configure the, the TypeScript compiler to just treat .js or Java, regular JavaScript files as TypeScript. So you don't even need to change the extension if you don't want to. The other aspect that's important to note here about this being a superset is that the TypeScript team, this is not CoffeeScript. They're not trying to change 
the nature of what JavaScript is and what its strengths are. They're trying to build on top of that. Um, they're, they're, they love JavaScript. This is not the .NET team doing JavaScript. This is a very small team that's focused on you know, making JavaScript work for large-scale applications. The second thing is optional static typing. Again, the emphasis here is on optional. If you don't want to use the static data types, you don't have to. Um, the data types that it brings in aren't, don't go above and beyond the types that are already part of JavaScript. There's that respect again for the language and for the platform. Um, but it does do static analysis on your code. You have a compiler. And so this makes things happen inside of an editor or IDE that you just otherwise um, wouldn't be able to have. And we'll see some examples of that when we get to the demos. The last thing is features from the future. So this is important to us because we're doing decorators, which is more of a future-looking thing. Um, Babel also does this, of course. But this allows us to take advantage of things um, which a couple of years ago was important, you know, ES6 features as they were being finalized, um, ES7, which now is a thing. There's only two features, but hey, it is a real thing now. And then, I don't know, ES next, ES++, right? Everything that's, that's still at the proposal stage. One more thing to mention before we get off this TypeScript topic is that it's flexible, right? Whatever editor you're using today, chances are there's a plugin or extension that's going to, to give you support for TypeScript. You don't have to change your tools. Um, there's also rich support for the build tool chain or, or your, your you know, build process tool chain as well um, for Grunt, Gulp, Webpack, you name it. So these are just some examples. Obviously, the Visual Studio products from Visual Studio proper to Visual Studio code give you a great experience, but WebStorm has always been right at the top of, of supporting TypeScript really well. Um, Atom, through the Atom uh, TypeScript extension, works really well and is, was one of my favorites for a long time. Sublime, Emacs, Eclipse, the list goes on and on. And so inside of these editors, they're leveraging the TypeScript language service. So it's really kind of a level playing field in terms of the feature set that they can draw upon. You know, static uh, checking, symbol-based navigation, statement completion, code refactoring, all of these things can be made available inside of these editors. Okay, so on to the demos. So, you know, uh, self-admission time here. In order to show something, you know, you need something to write code against, right? And I typically do this really stupid, simple, arbitrary app that kind of looks something like this. Now I'm a creative guy, so I come up with a name like my class. And then I stretch it a little bit and say prop one, prop two, and then have something called my method that I can decorate. Well, that gets a little boring, so I thought I would jazz it up a little bit and call my awesome class and better prop one and even better prop two. Well, that's kind of lame too, right? So I decided to go try to model something that was a little more real world, books and ratings. So we're going to have a book class and we're going to have the ability to call add rating and, and basically associate a rating with that book. And that will allow me to talk about some, some interesting O'Reilly titles that are going to be coming out soon. So, yeah, you know, copying and pasting from Stack Overflow, that is bound to be a classic, right? Or if you're a front-end developer, you might be interested in this one as well, uh, rewriting your front-end every six weeks. And at the top there is a little small, so I'll read it to you. It says, this time, you have definitely chose the right libraries and build tools. And if that's not your cup of tea, then Googling the error message, the internet will make those bad words go away. OK, so on with the demo. And then switch over here. I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code. Oh, hey, who said that? Yeah, one guy. <laughs> um, it's a free editor, right? It's not an IDE. Even I, I think they actually did a disservice to the product by associating it with Visual Studio because there's all these like connotations that people have with Visual Studio as this like monolithic huge IDE. This is not that. This is much more akin to Atom. So this is our our book class. Pretty basic. It's the only thing that I have in this node module, so I'm exporting that as a default. I have three properties. I have a title that's of type string. So these are the, the static types that I'm using here that are part of, of TypeScript. 
we have a publisher property and we have a ratings. That's an array of rating. So rating is another class that I'm importing into this class. We have a constructor, and then we have this add rating method that takes a username, a rating, and a comment. And then internally, I'm instantiating a rating object, passing in those values, and then I have, then I'm pushing that rating objects onto the ratings array, and then I return it, just so that we have a return value. Okay, so we do need to, because this is TypeScript, like I mentioned, we do need to build our project. So I just pressed Command Shift B to invoke the task runner. Visual Studio Code is saying, hey, you haven't configured any tasks. So I'm going to choose to configure that. And then I'm going to select the TypeScript option here that is asking or prompting me to say, hey, do you have a TS config? And I do have a TS config in my project. So that's the one I'm going to choose. And that just creates the hook, the binding between issuing the command to build and, and running that task. So that was really easy to miss. So I'm going to zoom in here. Whoa. Is that big enough? It's kind of cool that it does that, though it's a little ridiculous. So this section right down here is where we get our status. So if I build one more time, see the spinner? That was it compiling. And then you can see here that we have no errors, no warnings. Let me zoom back out. And then I'm just going to go run this app. OK. So nothing is really happening at this point because we're not outputting. There's no output of our application. We're calling, we're running this dist slash index.js. And if we go take a look at that, Again, keep it bearing in mind that we're compiling. So we have our source files here under the source folder, but then we're compiling over to dist. So if we go look inside of here, we see an index.js. We see our models have compiled down to JavaScript. Just be aware that it's there. We're not going to really look at those files, but, but that's what we're actually executing at one runtime. If we go look at index.ts, it's equally as simplistic and, and really uninteresting as, as the class itself. I import the book class. I'm then instantiating some of those great O'Reilly titles that are coming out. And then I say book one, add rating, and I pass in John Smith and Sally Jones. I pass in their ratings. So this is the scenario. Think of this application as something bigger than the arbitrary small app that I have with a lot more moving pieces and, and something is amiss and we're, or we're trying to add a new feature. And what we want to be able to do is is be able to like introspect into this method and, and kind of collect information about it. So we're talking about logging, right? So the idea behind this, there's a number of ways we could do this. We could debug, right? Absolutely, and there's powerful tools to do that. But let's say we want to collect data over a longer period of time, like days or maybe even weeks. And who knows, maybe instead of writing to the console, we're writing to a database, for instance. So I'm going to add a console log here, and I'm going to say add write rating method called with args, and then I'm just going to say JSON stringify, and I'm going to stringify the arguments array for this that's passed in this method. Then down here, I'm going to do the same thing, but this time with the return. So now I have console log add rating method return value, JSON.stringify, and then the rating object. So now if we build again, and then come back out here and run this, we now have some, we now have some statements that are, that are being written out. And then again, nothing fantastic, but we can see every time that that method is invoked, we can see the arguments that are being passed in. We can see the return value that's coming back out of that method. And so that's the first call, and here's the second call. So that's all good and great, but again, imagine that this is a substantially larger application, and maybe we want to log any number of, of classes, properties, or methods as they're being used in our application. This is really not the way to go about doing that. So imagine then that we do this, that we want to have a log decorator. So we say at log and decorate that method to say this is something that we're interested in logging. So right now, this doesn't work, of course, because this log decorator doesn't exist in our project. So we need to fix this. So if we go over to log decorator, we're going to code this up real quick. So it turns out 
that a decorator is just associated with a function or maps to a function. So we're going to export default, and we'll say function, and we'll call this lock because that's the, the name of the decorator. The name of the function and the name of the decorator need to match in this case. And that is the shell of our decorator. Now, we do need to do something a little different here, though, because there are arguments that are going to be passed to us. And then there's three, in fact. The first one is target. Target, in this case, because we're decorating a, uh, a method, is going to be the prototype of the constructor function, right? Because when we're working with classes, we want those methods to be on the prototype, not part of the instances that will be made from that, con from that class. So that target is the constructor function prototype. Then we're going to say key string. The key is it sounds exactly what it is. It's the name of the method that we were, that we're decorating. And then the last one is descriptor. And this is going to be something that's is called typed property descriptor. And that might sound maybe familiar, maybe not. But if we put our cursor on it and press F12, then we'll navigate over to the definition for typed property descriptor. So where's this interface live and where is it coming from? If we zoom in here, you'll notice that this is a file called lib.d.ts. D.ts files are TypeScript definition files, and this one is not one that we control or edit directly ourselves. It's part of TypeScript, and it's what provides the definition for all of the built-in JavaScript objects. So what that tells us is that this property descriptor is part of JavaScript. And in fact, if you go look at, the, at, at MDN, if you go to the documentation for object-defined property, these properties right here, these six properties, enumerable, configurable, writable, value, get and set, are what you use to create properties dynamically on objects by calling define property. So I'm going to copy that and just bring it over for reference as we're working on our decorator here. Just so we can keep that in mind as, as we're doing our, our implementation. So, we're decorating a method. We want to preserve the original method. So that's the first thing that we're going to do, is we're going to say, let original method. And we get that reference by looking at descriptor value. If this was a property, value would be the value that was assigned to that property. Since we're decorating a method, the value is the reference to the function that is that method, right? So we now have grabbed a reference to that. And now we can turn around on descriptor and redefine, redefine the function that makes up that method. So we can say descriptor.value is going to be a new function. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to return that descriptor from our decorator. And the reason for that is, is that if we don't return anything, the, the decorator framework that, that is calling into us won't know that we're intending to replace the implementation that we're decorating. By returning the descriptor, that is sort of the heads up, if you will, that says, hey, you need to install this property descriptor over the top of what was there because we're replacing the implementation, which is exactly, we're, we're going to wrap that method. So inside of here, if we just built this and ran this right now, what would happen is that there would be no behavior, right? Because we've, we've redefined what that method is, but this method currently has no implementation. Well, we captured the original method, so we can say let result equals original method dot apply, because that method is no longer attached or, or installed on, on that, that object, the prototype. So we need to give it what this is. So we're going to use apply and pass in its correct this, and then we're going to supply the args. Well, where do we get the args? Well, we're not taking in parameters right now, but we can solve that by using a REST argument, or REST operator, excuse me. And then we can say that this is going to be an array of any, because we don't, we don't know how many arguments we're going to get. We're making this general purpose. Um, and we also don't know the type, so we're just going to say it can be any data type. Now with that in place, we've decorated the method and we're also preserving its behavior, but we really haven't like, done anything above and beyond that. But we have a place to do that now, right? So we have a before and we have an after. So with that knowledge and this opportunity, we can take these log statements 
and, and bring them over here and use them. And again, we're, we don't know necessarily that we're calling add ratings, so we're going to parameterize this. And we'll use the key. That's the name of the method that's passed in. So that's very convenient that we have that. And then json.stringify, instead of arguments, we called our arguments args. And then we'll do the same thing for the second. Again, we can parameterize the method name to make this general purpose. And then here, oh, it's the wrong statement. All right, so add rating is now a key, and the return value, instead of rating obj like we had before, is just result. Then we can come over here and just completely get rid of that. We're not going to use that anymore. And if we build, you'll see that we have a build error. So if we click on that, we can see that the error says, cannot find name log. It's a pretty simple mistake. If we click on that, it takes us to the air. We didn't import it, right? So we created our decorator, but we didn't bring it in uh, to this module. So we're going to say uh, import log from, and I need to go up, and it's in decorators, and then it's log, get this right, decorator. OK. And build again. Now we're happy. So now we come back out here, and then let's rerun our app. Now we have the output looks remarkably similar. There's a little bit of difference. We're not, we're not JSON stringifying the arguments array, so we lost the, the, uh, the argument positions with the args, but we still have the values here. Um, but we still get those, you know, the output, the console logs that we were expecting. So just for kicks, let's add another method. And then let's say that this is going to be a number. And then let's see, we'll return arg1, and then maybe we just times it by two. And then we'll add our log decorator on that guy. Run this. We do need to go over to index and actually call that method. That would be good. So book one, here we can see when I dot off of that, I can see that I've got another method that I can call. Oops. And pass in two. Let's build and run. Now we can see here that another method, you know, just by adding that log decorator, now we have logging here too. So you can see how easily we could, we could create that log decorator and just start using it throughout our application wherever uh, we might need to. So that's a good start. Let's see what else we can do with this. Okay. So it turns out that we can use these as building blocks. It's composable, right? So if we open this project is just like the last project that has the book and rating. If we go take a look at book here, it's the same class. Um, we still have our log decorator on here. But this is a new and improved lock decorator that, that we have done some extra work with. So now this, this log decorator can be used at the class level. And we can decorate our properties as well. And if we build, we need to define the task for, to build, for building TypeScript, and then run. And now we're going to get a lot more messaging because we added all those log decorators at, at different points. So for instance, you'll see here that, that the class book has been declared. We can see that our book constructor has been called with those arguments. We can see within the constructor function the fact that we're setting title and, and publisher, those properties, to those values. And then we can see coming out of the constructor function the instance of the book class. Here's the second object that's being created. And then we can see the same method calls that we had before to add rating. OK, what else can we do? Let's say that this method, maybe it's, it hasn't been performing like we thought it, it, it's, it should be. Um, it's been slow, right? But we suspect it might be slow. 
So we're going to decorate this with our perf decorator. And let me import this in. So this is going to do what it sounds like it's going to do, right? It's going to measure the performance of this method. Actually, let's, let's do one more thing, just so that we don't get uh, something that's difficult to measure. Let's, let's block execution for a second, just so we can see this met method actually taking some time uh, to finish processing. So we're going to build, and then we'll run. OK, so here we can see add rating was called here. And we can see that the execution time was 1,001 milliseconds. So now we're getting, by adding our perf decorator, now we're getting you know, performance statistics that, that we could take advantage of. OK, so now we need to fix the problem. Well, imagine then, well, you don't have to imagine because we have it. Let's say that we have a Memoize decorator. And we've gotten together as a dev team and decided, you know, we really can't change the implementation. Let's go ahead and just make sure that if, if subsequent calls are made with the same argument values, that we return a cached value. Then I'm going to go into index and make another call here. So we're making two calls to add rating, um, both with the same you know, arguments. That way, we would expect the first one to take about a second. And the second one should return immediately because the value should be cached. So I'm going to build, and then start. It's going to hang, and then it's going to return. And so now we can see that the initial call took that 1,001 milliseconds. And then here, when we made our second call, we see this. It says returning memoized value, what the object was that we cached for the add rating method. And then the execution time on that took zero seconds, which is what we expected. Okay, so the idea here again is that you can imagine, you know, libraries of decorators that are building blocks that you can compose behavior uh, or create behavior in your application through composition. And in fact, if we go back to the slides, let's take a look at some specific examples of that. So, the truth of the matter is, is that most of the time you're not going to be creating your own decorator libraries. Maybe if it was a big project or if you're doing something specific, you're going to be consuming them, like we were showing the Angular 2 example earlier. So what are some examples of that? So all of these are um, NPM packages that I found online um, a couple weeks ago. And so I'm just going to show you some quick examples across some different frameworks and libraries. So here's an example of an express set of decorators. So test controller is being decorated with web controller. And that slash hello is the base URL for that controller. Then we have say hello action, which is being associated with, with a get HTTP verb. And it's being associated with slash world as a path. And we can also see that it's, we're injecting in this my middleware function. And we also have this web use. So this other middleware, because it's not associated with any other path, it's going to be applied um, to any other path that's defined in this controller. Lodash. So here's an example of decorators that aren't doing anything other than wrapping uh, methods or functions that are available as part of Lodash. So here's our a person class, and we have after three on get full name. So that's going to only invoke that function or, or execute that function after the third time it's been invoked. Debounce is exactly what it sounds, is that when it finally does get executed, it's going to have a 100 second milli delay before it, it runs. Curry, again, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's going to take this do heavy processing and create two functions, right, that can be called in a curry fashion. So the first function will take arg1 and return a function that you can pass in arg2. Then we also have memoize on that, so that, you know, if we're passing the same arguments, then we're using cached, or we get cached values back. React decorators, I'm not a React developer. So if someone here is a React developer, you might do a better job of explaining this than I would. But the idea here, I believe, is that you can take your data store. So in this case, we have foo store and bar store. And we're able to associate those um, or connect those with this component without having to take on writing that code ourselves within this component. So it's a, it's a very like, modular, modular way of, of you know, hooking things together. And then it's 
it's exposing or setting foo and var properties um, on this component. And it's taking care of doing all the wiring, of listening for those of, you know, change events and whatnot, so you don't have to you know, write that code for each one of your components. All right, so to wrap up, um, there is a bit of a word of caution. So, you know, if you're thinking about experimenting with decorators, it's really just about that, it's experimenting. Think about what you're doing. If it's a personal small project, have at it, right? Um, if you're on the job and you're doing real work, this is more of a future thinking thing. You don't want to start betting your, your, you know, your company's or your client's application on something that's gonna be in flux, and it is in flux. Um, the proposal, in fact, has changed in some minor or you know, slight ways from the way it's actually implemented in Babel and TypeScript. The external, the way that you, you use decorators hasn't changed, but the implementation behind the scene has. Um, eventually, we'll get there, and, and TypeScript will support that, but it's still very early days, and it'll take some time to catch up. So just be aware that, that, that this is to get you thinking about you know, a direction that we're heading, right? And along that line, uh, TypeScript roadmap. Um, there's features around decorators in 2.0 and 2.1 that they're proposing. Um, they're not big features, but they are going to be nice improvements, um, so things that, that we're looking forward to. Um, the decorator's proposal itself is available here on Yehuda Katz's GitHub repo. Um, he's the one who actually created the decorator's proposal um, and is the person that's sort of like instigating all of this, which is a great thing. And that's what I've got for you. So thanks for listening, and uh, there you go.